Amen. All right. Do you guys ever have that fear of the unknown or like the fear of uncertainty or you're just a little anxious about like what could happen or it's your first time doing something without somebody you've always done it with? Like you're going somewhere and you've been there before, but you've never driven there. There's always that person who gave you a ride and you're like meeting them there this time. And you're like, I actually don't know how to get there because I've never paid attention while you're driving. Is anybody like that? That's just me. I'm like, I don't pay attention when I'm not driving. So he's like, how do you get there? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> like I've gone to Michigan to visit Abigail's family so many times. I used to know it when I was like 22. I had it memorized because I didn't even have a smartphone. So, you know, like you get used to like looking at signs. Now I'm too dependent on my smartphone. I'm like, if I had to get there now, I maybe could. No. Maybe. <laughs> but like, I don't know too. And I'm like from the generation too, where like we, G GPSs were just new and like some people had them and some people didn't. And you were getting hand drawn maps from people. You guys remember that? They're like putting landmarks on there. They're like the windmill. And you're like, what? If you, hit the, if you hit the train tracks, you went too far. And you're like looking and you're like, oh, you're like, oh, I went too far. You're like, you're just like that fear of the unknown, the uncertainty. You don't know what's next. You don't know what's going to happen. It's just like that uncomfortable feeling. Jesus, as he's headed to the cross, has that moment where he he speaks into that feeling for the disciples. You know, he's coming out to the end of Holy Week, you know, this moment where he rode in on the donkey and he's been spending time with them and the Passover meal. He just had that Passover meal where he said, this is my body, this is my blood. He, he has this meaningful moment with them, but he also tells them, I'm about to leave. Peter, you're about to deny me and one of you is going to betray me. It's like some heavy stuff. This is like, they're like, Peter, they kind of viewed him as the leader. They're like, Peter's going to deny you? And Peter's like, no way. And he's like, yes, before the rooster crows. And they're like, one of us is going to deny you? And he's like, yeah. Or one of us is going to betray you? And he's like, yeah. And he goes, and I'm leaving. And I can only imagine that like as a follower of Jesus, your disciple, you've been hanging out with him three years. You're like, I thought this was going to go differently. Like they don't even know what's about to happen fully. You know, we've, been, we've given our life to you, Jesus. We've been following you. We just celebrated you. We were waving palm branches and saying you're the king and we thought you were going to do some king stuff. And now you're saying you're leaving? And I love this too because I was thinking about this from both perspectives this week. I was like, they're worried because Jesus told them some significant things. But I was like, but Jesus is heading into his most agonizing moments yet. Like Jesus is about to go to the garden and sweat blood because of the stress of knowing he's headed to the cross. He's about to go and be like, can't you guys just stay awake? He's about to go and, and face ridicule, be mocked, be beaten, ultimately crucified. And he's about to experience all of that, and he feels the weight of it. But even in that moment of feeling the weight of it, he's aware of their feelings. I'm like, what a good Savior. Like, what a kind Lord. Because it's like the one time he's like, guys, could you just have my back for once? Like, could you show me some emotional support? It's in that moment that he actually speaks these words. He says, don't let your hearts be troubled. And I'm just like, wow. What the kindness of our Savior. And so I want to look. We've been in a series. If you're brand new, if you haven't been with us or you've missed a few weeks, uh, you're totally, I'm so glad you're here. I just want to let you know what's happening. We're in the middle of a series where we're, we've been talking about the I am statements of Jesus. We've been calling it Jesus in his own words. There's seven times in the book of John where Jesus says, I am, and then he fills in the blank. He's claiming deity because he's saying ego a me, which is a reference to Yahweh in the Old Testament. And he's describing his character to us. And so as we look at the one for today, it's a famous one. He actually kind of lists three things in a, in a row. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. And that's actually in the middle of this section where Jesus is offering comfort. Where he knows what he's about to do, but he's still aware of the feelings of his followers. And so he starts and ends this little farewell cycle is what the theologians call it. He gives a bunch of like mini speeches in a row as he's getting ready to be crucified. And in this section, starting in verse 1 of chapter 14 through verse 27 of 14, he kind of bookends it with the same phrase. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. And then he goes on and teaches, and then he ends with the same thought. Don't let your hearts be troubled, and don't be afraid. I think 
what Jesus offers the disciples in this moment is something that he offers us and that we can hold on to. It's not like these are the eight things for peace and not to ever have trouble or any of those things, but there is kind of a list that Jesus works through. It's not exhaustive, but it's how he offers comfort in that moment. So I kind of want to just work through the passage, see how far we get before I run out of time and see if this offers us any peace as we head into unknown circumstances, as we think about those times where we're like, I don't know where I'm going or what's going to be next, or, you know, they're worried, Jesus, you're leaving us. What is this going to practically look like? Because I know that feeling of loss where you're like, I can't picture what this is going to be. What is this going to be without you, Jesus? And so this is what Jesus says to them. Don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. Uh, so would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? The way he structures that, this is just a side note, um, is like a Jewish oath. It's like, that's how in that culture they would be like, that's like a promise. He's like, I wouldn't have said it. And the way he says it like that back and forth is him being like, I mean it, just so you know. Jesus always told the truth anyway, but I just thought that was cool. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. And so Jesus starts this little comfort moment saying, don't let your hearts be troubled. He's like, I'm going and preparing a place for you. He's like, I've already got plans. I've got it figured out, which is such a good reassurance. Like when you don't know what's next or you don't know what's happening, you just want somebody in authority to be like, I've thought about this ahead of time. Like I have plans. I've actually prepared a place for you. You know, I'm actively doing it. And he says all of that. And he goes, and you know the way. And there's this beautiful imagery here. This like bridegroom imagery. Because in that time, you would get engaged. And then there would be this this moment where the dads like exchange stuff. And then this time period. And then there's a year where the, the bridegroom would go and add an addition onto his family's house. Where you're going to live. He'd build it onto his family's house and then he would come back and get his bride and then they would have that finished ceremony of the marriage and then he'd bring her to the home. And Jesus is using that same imagery. He's like, I'm going and I'm preparing a place for you, like where we're gonna ultimately be together. And I love this so much because, you know, depending on your translation, he says, I'm preparing many rooms or mansions is like the King James Version, the New King James Version. And in the Greek, it's literally the same root word as what Abigail talked about last week for remaining and literally can be translated as abiding places. He's like, I'm going and creating these abiding places for you. I'm adding rooms onto my father's house in preparation for you. So Jesus' first offer of comfort is that a reminder that, hey, this isn't unplanned. You know, I'm going and preparing a place for you. I love this. I wrote this down. Heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. That none of it's on accident. That like he loves you and he chose you. He predestined you before the foundation of the world. And he's actively preparing a place for you ahead of time. Heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. That he loves you enough that, that he saw you individually and said, I, I'm, I'm making space for you. I'm building a home where you can perfectly be in God's presence forever. Heaven is a real place. It's not a state of mind. It's not something you achieve. It's not this ultimate enlightenment. It's a real place that Jesus is preparing for you to be in the presence of God forever. It's a prepared place for prepared people. And how this offers comfort, one of the keys to peace is to replace current anxiety with the certainty of the future. That's going to help you because I don't know what's going on today or tomorrow always. I don't know. There's uncertainty in my life. And the disciples are feeling that. They're like, Jesus, you're leaving. I don't know what that means yet. Like, and Jesus is like, hey, before we even get into more of the details, I just want you to know there's security in the future. That you can have peace today, even in the middle of uncertainty, because there's certainty for tomorrow. There's certainty for the future. I'm preparing a place for you. 
So I don't know what your uncertainty is. Maybe, maybe there's uncertainty in a job or a relationship. You have a new opportunity that's positive. You have something going on that's negative. There's a change in fin- family dynamics. There's a loss of some kind that, that feels like I can't picture tomorrow, next week. I can't picture this year, what it's going to be like. And it's causing me some amount of worry. And Jesus says, don't let your hearts be troubled. I'm preparing a place for you. And I want you to have peace in knowing there's certainty in the future, even if there's uncertainty now. And I know that offers me comfort. It's like a child who, who might not know what's going on, but is scooped up by their parents. And they're like, it's all right. We've, we've got a plan. You might not know the next steps, but we ultimately know where this is going to end. And there's just power in that future hope. There's power in, in just holding on to the peace of one day this will all be made right. I don't know about you, but I've experienced the brokenness of this world. You know, like we're a hope-filled, joy-filled church. Like hope is built into the name. We're like, God is going to do good stuff in your life. He's ultimately got good plans for you. But our hope is ultimately in who he is more than what he does. And ultimately, our hope is in, in the future promise of restoration and all things made new. That, that revelation, the last book of the Bible, talks about one day every tear will be wiped away. All things will be made right. We'll be in the presence of God forever. There will be joy and peace. And Jesus is reminding them of that. Hey, these temporary troubles, that's the language Paul uses. He's like, these temporary troubles, he's a church planner. He, he planted a bunch of the churches that, and wrote letters to them in the New Testament. He's like, these temporary troubles you're facing are nothing compared to the future glory. And I think sometimes we just need that reminder. Hey, there's light at the end of the tunnel. Like this isn't the end of the story. I don't know if it's going to be resolved right now, but ultimately it's going to be fixed. That Jesus offers comfort by reminding them he's preparing a place. But he keeps going. He goes, you know the way to the place where I'm going. And I love this because they do, because they know him and he is the way. And he's about to say that. But in that moment when he's like, you know the way, they're like, they look at each other. I just picture the disciples all the time. They're like, do we know the way? Do we know where Jesus is going? Because it's like so many times Jesus says something and they're like, no, I don't think so. And that's what happens right now. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? Jesus is like, you know the way. So is Jesus wrong in this moment? No, they just didn't understand what he meant. He's like, you know the way. And he's about to say, I am the way. Like the way isn't this path. This way is a person. And so they're like, Jesus, we don't know the way because we don't know where you're going. And Jesus answered, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I love this because the first way Jesus offers peace is he lets them know that he's preparing a place, but the second way he lets them know that he's providing a path. He's like, I am the way. I am the truth. I'm the life. People, scholars, people who write uh, commentaries and notes about the the study of the scripture, they talk about how the three things Jesus says here are the three things that we all need. The three things really that the prodigal son needed, that that when he leaves the father's house and he goes his own way, he, he sins and says, I think I know best. He's lost. He doesn't know the way. He's ignorant. He doesn't know the truth. And he's spiritually dead. He's outside of the family. And that's all of us outside of God. We're lost and and ignorant, and and dead. But Jesus says, I'm the solution for all of that. I'm the way, I'm the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. And I love this because it's both very, very exclusive and very, very inclusive. Because he's like, guys, there's only one way, but that way is literally offered to everybody through me. He's like, I, he's about to die so that everybody can get there if they want to get there. He's like, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Like, he's like, I am the way. It's like, if you have this place you're trying to get into, you love it, it's super cool. Um, You know, there's just like the best party you've ever been to in your life is there. It's better than anything you've ever experienced. And it's like, Jesus would be like saying, there's one door that you can get in. And he's like, but I, I already paid for you to get in. He's like, I, I'm going to pay so that you can get in. I'm going to put your name on the list. As long as you choose that door, your name will be on the list. 
and you're like, nah, I'm good. I think I know how to get in. I have enough money. Or like in this case, you'd maybe think like, I've done enough good things. My grandma was a Christian. I grew up in church or, you know, or, or, you know, I just think there probably is more doors. I think there's some windows. I think there's a way. I'm going to come in through the roof like that guy did, Jesus, when you were preaching. No, but that's not how it works. Jesus is saying, no, there is only one way. He's like, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. No one can get to, to the place where they're ultimately in relationship with God in heaven, the prepared place he has for you, fullness of joy, the thing we all long for, the thing we're created for. You know, C.S. Lewis says, if there's something inside of me that can't be satisfied for anything in this world, then maybe I wasn't created for this world. There's something inside all of us that longs for something that we cannot have here. And that's heaven. That's in God's presence. And Jesus says, you know, I'm the way. And you know, I'm going to pay for you to get there through my death and resurrection. Ephesians 2 says that you're saved by grace through faith. What that means is Jesus paid the price. That's the grace. And the faith is just choosing to actually go through that door. I'm saved by grace through faith. You're telling me, Jesus, all I have to do is receive the price that you paid for me and then go the way you told me to go and I can get in there? That's so beautiful. It's both exclusive and inclusive. It's Jesus is saying like, hey, this is just the truth. I'm the creator. Because what I think is funny is like that, that party, I know this is a broken illustration. You can only take it so far. But that party you're trying to get into of heaven, it's like Jesus is like, yeah, I created that. Like me and my dad, like we were there when that was made, when everything was made. And so you think like we're not being fair by, by saying there's not other ways here. He's like, but like we're the ones who made it. And so Jesus is saying, like, I'm just letting you know this is the way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I love this. This is from Thomas at Kempis. He was uh, an early church father. And this was his, one of his meditations that he would kind of read through. He says, follow thou me. This is from Jesus' perspective. I am the way and the truth and the life. Without the way, there is no going. Without the truth, there is no knowing. Without the life, there is no living. I am the the way which thou must follow, the truth which thou must believe, the life for which thou must hope. I am the invaluable way, the infallible truth, and the never-ending life. I am the straightest way, the sovereign truth, life true, life blessed, life uncreated. In that time period, too, when you were speaking and you said things in triads like that, like in groups of three, it was either usually perfection or a summary statement. And so Jesus is almost giving a summary statement of his whole life and ministry. He's like, you know, I've already explained some of these other ones, the ones we've been working through the last few weeks. I'm the bread of life. You know, I offer satisfaction and I'm the light of the world. I offer direction and protection and I, I'm the gate and I'm the good shepherd and I lay down my life for the sheep. He's basically summarizing that and saying, you know what? I'm the way, the truth, and the life. My whole mission can be summarized in that. Like he came to seek and save the lost. Like he loved you enough to come and suffer so that you could have a life. He died for me and he died for you. He's such a good savior. He's better than we deserve. You know, we don't deserve any of that. And yet he willingly gave up his life. And so in this moment where his disciples are like, I don't know what's next. Jesus is like, hey, I'm preparing a place for you. In his own suffering, knowing where he's headed, he's like, I'm preparing a place for you. And I am the way to that place. Just stay close to me. Just follow me. Trust my teaching. He keeps going and he says, if you really know me, you will know my father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And Philip, one of the other disciples, said, Lord, show us the father and that will be enough for us. And Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you for such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing the work. And this is something that Jesus actually teaches at a few different moments where he's reminding the disciples that the Father and him are one. Like everything he does is in step with the Father. It's under his authority, that they're on the same page. 
And he's like, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And I think this is something that would be good, like, in your group this week to talk about, is how is your image of God the Father different than your image of Jesus? And why is that? Like, because I, I know it's true. Like, I've talked to some of you. Some of you like, you, you have this view that, like, God was really, really angry, and then Jesus is, like, the cool son who's like, he's all right, guys, I got it. Like, I'm going to calm him down, and, like, I'm, it's all going to be good. But that's not how it is. Jesus is like, I, I represent him perfectly. Actually, everything I do is what he's telling me to do. Everything I say is what he's telling me to say. If you've seen me, you've seen him. And so I think that's something good for us to work through as followers of Jesus and, and, and followers of Yahweh is, is saying, why, why do I have a discrepancy here between who I see the Father as and who I see Jesus as? Because Jesus is like, guys, just, just you know, you can trust me. Because they're like, how will we know we can get into your father's house? Like, just show us the father. And he's like, you've seen me. I'm the perfect representation of my father. We're one. We're of the same substance. We can get into some deep theology there. You know, like, if you want to talk about the Trinity this week or something, I won't answer you because it's Easter week, but we'll hang out in April and I'll tell you about the Trinity. I'm just being honest, guys. I'll talk about the Trinity, just not this week. And so Jesus is like, Hi, I'm the perfect representation of the Father. And I think that's good. It's because if you want to know the God you serve better, get to know Jesus better. If you want to have a more accurate picture of who God is, spend more time with Jesus. Study the Gospels. Be like, God, that's who you are. Oh, I see you there. I, I see you telling the truth firmly, but also offering grace freely. I see you in love and compassion, being willing to slow down. But I also see that, that you are the creator, that, that you are holy, that you're, you're a judge, but you're, you're kind and full of love. Like, if you want to have a better picture of God, look at who Jesus is. So Jesus is like, I'm preparing a place. I'm providing a path. I'm showing you a picture of the Father. But he keeps going and he says, Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. He's like, hey guys, even if you don't understand fully that I represent God, like look at what God is doing through me. Look at what I'm doing. Look at what the Spirit's doing through me. Because it's all one. It's three in one. And he's like, look at the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they will do them even greater. They'll do even greater things. What a crazy statement. Did you guys read that? Are you paying attention? Am I in the right room? <laughs> Just kidding. Um, he says, very truly, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing and will do them in even greater ways because I'm going to the Father. I was like, do you believe that? That's pretty incredible. He's like, and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. And some of you, if you're a brand new Christian, you're like, let's go. I'm gonna go ask for some good stuff right after service. <laughs> but I just wanna give a little caveat. This is not that you've got an out because he is miraculous and he does incredible things. He can do more than you can ask, think, or imagine. But I want you to understand when he says in my name, it's as a representation. He's not just saying slap my name on the end of your wish list. He's saying as as you do it in my name, like if you go and you go and talk to somebody who works here and you're like, on behalf of Pastor Dan, you better be saying what's actually on behalf of me. Better. You know what I'm saying? Like represent me well. And he's saying, you can ask the Father anything in my name if it's aligned with my will and you can be rest assured that that's going to get answered. Because even in, in 1 John, John writes another letter. He says, this is the confidence we have approaching God. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And so we have a boldness. We can come, we can be like, you know, I'm with Jesus. I'm praying in Jesus' name. If, you, if you're new, if you're like, why do everybody, they, they pray, they say, dear God, and they say all this stuff. They ask for things, they pray for other people, and then they say, in Jesus' name, amen. Like, why do we do that? We're doing it because we're saying, I'm praying this in alignment with who Jesus is. I'm praying this in Jesus' name. Jesus is like, whatever you ask in my name. Like, you're coming to God saying like, Jesus is the one who, who said I have a path here. Jesus is the one who opened the veil. We'll talk about that a little bit next week. Jesus is the one who made it so I have access to God. 
and I'm coming and praying in his name. If you fully believe this, and I'm talking about partially, I'm talking, you know, like there's things that like we believe it, but like we don't believe it. And it's like we slowly start to believe it more and more because I think what we believe starts to show up in our life. Like you can't tell me you believe something if it never changes anything about you. Like if I told you there is money back there, there's a million dollars in the corner just sitting there and you can have it if you go get it. If you're like, yeah, I believe you. But if you didn't go back there, I'd be like, you don't believe me. And there's not. <laughs> but, but you get what I'm saying. You would be crazy if you're like, I believe it, but I'm not going to do anything about it. Like we act according to what we believe. Like we do the things that are in alignment with our faith. And Jesus is like, hey, I want you guys to get this. And this is going to happen over time. This is going to be something that you live into, you grow into. You, you start to see that he really is as good as he says. He's, he's like, but you can ask boldly in my name. If it's in alignment with God's will, he's going to hear you and answer you. And I'm like, man, how would that change your prayer life? How would that change your prayer life? Because this is freeing too. Because I think sometimes we're like, we've, we're like, we're afraid to ask God for things, but he loves faith. God loves faith. In Hebrews, it says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. God loves faith. He even loves faith if it's a little wrong. Like the woman, she, she has this misguided faith. Like if she touches Jesus, she's going to get healed. But he responds anyway. Like she's healed through the power of God, even though her theology was a little bad or pretty bad. You know, he, God loves faith. And he's like, come to me in faith, in my name. If it's according to my will, I'm going to hear you and answer. And I'm like, how would that change how you pray. Because the reason I got on that little tangent about faith is because sometimes I think we were so afraid of how our view of God will change or, or of God's reputation or of all these other things that we start praying all these little outs for God. We're like, but, but if it's your will, and, and it's like, well, I don't have to say that. Like, he, he can just decide if that's his will or not. Like, he's already decided. And I might not know, but I'm going to ask in Jesus' name boldly and I know that if it is your will, you'll do it. And if it's not, I'm okay because I know who you are. I know that you're good anyway. I got the faith of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He's going to show up for me, but if, even if he doesn't, I'm okay. Because I trust in him more than I trust in the outcome. I know that ultimately he's preparing a place for me and that someday all things will be made right. But I'm going to pray as Jesus prayed, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, I'm praying for glimpses of that future reality in my current situation. And so sometimes I think we overcomplicate it. I don't know if this is God's will that I would be healed. I don't know. I don't know if it's God's will. Like there is nuance to that and we can, we can talk about that. We can have hard conversations. But in, in an ultra simplified version, I know that ultimately God wants me healed because in heaven, I know there is no suffering. There is no pain. There is no brokenness. There is no sin. There is no crying. So I, if I'm going to pray as Jesus prayed, God, I want your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus is giving us a little clue. Heaven looks like God's will. If you're like, I don't know if this is God's will, it's like, well, does that look like heaven? God, I don't know if it's your will that I would break through this depression. Well, there's no depression in heaven. I think God wants that. I don't know how he's going to do that. I don't know if he's going to do that through counseling, through medicine, supernaturally, but I believe he wants it for you. And so it's like, God, we're just going to pray boldly. I don't have to have all the answers. I think sometimes we make not knowing our excuse for not asking. And I would rather ask and have the answer be no than be too afraid to ask when he maybe is going to say yes. Because here's the thing, church. If we have a faith that's stronger in who God is than what he does, then we're okay with the no. We're okay with the no, but we're bold enough to ask for the yes. Because I'm like, guys, if we prayed this prayer, if we, if we believe that Jesus said, you will do greater things. Like the people who are following after him, you're going to do greater things. Like, Jesus did a lot of great stuff. He saw miracles. He's praying, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. He says, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. So let's pray for heaven to invade earth. Let's pray for healing. Let's, let's pray for reconciliation. Let's pray for renewal. Let's pray for the prodigal. Let's pray for justice. Let's pray for peace. Let's pray for joy. God might say, yes, no, maybe, wait but I'm not going to let that stop me from asking. 
Because he says, ask. And Jesus offers this as part of their comfort. Guys, I know there's uncertainty as I just told you a lot of stuff that Peter's going to deny me, one of you is going to betray me and I'm leaving. But don't let your hearts be troubled. I'm preparing a place for you. I'm providing a pathway for you. I'm giving you a picture of the Father. I'm showing you the privilege of prayer. And last, I'm letting you know of the promise of the Holy Spirit. And I don't have time to fully get into this because he actually goes into a huge part here and then continues on for a few chapters. And there's so much on the Holy Spirit, but, but I do want to get into it a little bit. And in John 14, verse 15, he says, if you love me, keep my commands. Trying, I'm looking at the clock trying to decide if I need to go on another tangent or not, you know, because it's like action follows affection. And I think sometimes we take verses like this, if you love me and you keep my commands, and we have a bad picture of God because we ha don't have a picture of the Father that matches Jesus, and we picture God in the Old Testament in a twisted way, not God in the Old Testament in a loving way, and we think God is saying, prove you love me. If you really love me, you'll, you'll do what I said. And even if we don't think it outright, like there's something inside of us that feels that, that's like, if you really love me, you'll obey me. And then we're like, but God, I do love you. I just really am not good at it. But I just want to let you know, that's not what this verse is saying. Jesus is letting them know the principle that your actions follow your affections. That if you love him, you naturally will obey his commands that you're going to slowly become more like him because as you love him and get to know him, as you see him, you become more like him and you start changing. You're like, man, I'm hanging out with all these Jesus people and I'm reading the word and I'm coming to church and I'm not doing some of the stuff I used to do. And I'm starting to do new things I never did before. It's like a natural outflow. Jesus is letting them know, this is how you'll know you love me. You're just going to start doing the stuff that I told you to do. You're going to start becoming more like me. And this is a good evaluation of like, am I becoming more like Jesus? Are my actions following my affections? Because here's the thing, guys. I love my wife. And I don't bring her flowers very much, period. <laughs> but if I do, it's because I love her. And not because she was like, if you love me, you'll bring me flowers. You know what I mean? My actions follow my affections. Like, I'm not doing things to prove to her I love her, I'm doing things as an expression of my love for her. And, and he says, if you love me, you obey my commands. All right, tangent over. We got to get back to it. Verse 16, I will ask the Father and he will give you an advocate. I don't know what translation you have. It's, it might say counselor, helper. It's, he's sending the Holy Spirit. And he said, he will be with you forever, the spirit of truth. I love this because this is in the same spot. If you're reading this, you know, Jesus is like, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And Jesus is like, I'm spending you the spirit of truth. My spirit. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives in you, and he will be with you. I will not leave you as orphans. That's a fun one. If you, if you know how to do a word study, if you've got like Strong's Concordance or you can look it up on blueletterbible.com or something like that, do a little word study on that, that word. Like, it's, it's really cool. Um, it's like Jesus saying, I'm not going to leave you like unattended. It's like, it's beautiful. Um, he's like, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live in you and you also live in me. On that day, you will realize that I am in the Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. And it's this, this picture where it's like Jesus is like, you know, I'm going to be with you because I'm sending my spirit to you, and my spirit's actually going to help you love me and live the way I'm calling you to live. He's going to actually be an advocate for you. He's going to be a helper, a comforter, a counselor to guide you into all truth, to help you live out the life I'm calling you to live. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, but Lord, why do you intend to show us yourself to us and not to the world? He misunderstands what Jesus is saying. Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. And I want to break this down really quick. Jesus is like, I'm preparing a place. I'm providing a path. I'm showing the privilege of prayer. 
I'm, I'm giving you a picture of the Father. He's like, but I'm, I'm giving you the promise of the Holy Spirit. He's like, someday your comfort is this. You will abide with me. In the meantime, I'm going to abide with you. That's, that's what this passage is, is about. Jesus is like, this is how you get comfort in me leaving. Ultimately, someday, we're going to be fully reunited. It's going to be heaven. It's going to be all things made right. It's going to be joy complete. It's going to be better than your best second of your best minute of your best hour of your best day. It's just going to be better than you can imagine. He's like, someday, and you can have hope in that. He's like, but until then, I'm going to come abide in you. I'm going to put my spirit inside of you. It's such a beautiful picture. Until you abide with me someday, I'm going to abide with you now. And when I abide with you, I'm going to help guide you into truth. I'm going to help you live the life that I'm calling you to live. And he says, all of this I have spoken while still with you, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I've said to you. Have you guys ever had that? You're going through something and a scripture pops in your head or this thought that's not your own. That's the Holy Spirit. That's the spirit of Christ. That's the spirit of truth. That's, that's him saying, hey, you're not with me yet, but I'm with you now. And I'm reminding you, hey, you, we're, we're going to change. This is how we're living now. It's a process. I'm going to speak to you. He's going to help you. Aren't you thankful for a helper who can guide you, who can speak to you and remind you of all truth? And then he says in verse 27, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. When they're troubled, Jesus is like, hey, ultimately, this is going to work out. I'm preparing a place for a prepared people. You can pray. I'm going to give you a picture of the Father. You don't know how to get there. I'm the way there. Just stay close to me. In fact, my spirit will live with you until one day you live with me. He's like, we've got this under control, guys. I'm with you. I'm giving you my peace, not as the world gives. I'm giving you my peace. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Inside Out. It's one of my favorite animated movies. If you haven't seen it, it's fun. Go watch it sometime. Um, and it's this animated movie from Pixar where there's these emotions that, that control the girl. You kind of like see inside her mind and it's like joy is taking over and then and sadness is taking over and then fear is taking over and you just like see this battle. And Jesus is like, you know what? I have peace that's really different. I'm going to give you my peace. And it's like, he's not just offering that peace produces itself in you. He's saying, my peace I give to you. That's such a beautiful picture. And that's a, that's a marker of the kingdom. Peace is one of the major characteristics of the kingdom of God. And I know so many of us want it. And we ebb and flow whether or not we have it. But this is a reminder that, hey, when we, we set our, our sight on the future, that these temporary troubles are nothing compared to the future glory. When we remember that Jesus is the way, that he, he says we can pray about anything and everything in his name, and that he sends the Holy Spirit to guide us. It comes with the gift of peace. That's not our own. That, hey, he's got this. He won't leave us as orphans. He sent his spirit to dwell with us. I love this because I need peace often. I need to remember the big picture. What Jesus is helping them do is zoom out of the moment to remember what's really going on. And I think as we follow Jesus, that's something we need to get better and better at doing. Zooming out of the moment, the uncertainty of today, and remembering the certainty of the future, the promise of the Holy Spirit, that he's with us and we can pray about whatever we're going through. That's not to minimize anything we're going through, but to maximize how good he is and to say we can invite him into that situation, that he'll guide us and that we can pray boldly in his name. I want to give an invitation for two things. One, if you've never found access to that room we were talking about, if you don't know Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life, you've never actually made a decision to follow him, you've been around church or you're around church people, like there is no like osmosis in the kingdom of God. You can't become a Christian by hanging out with Christians. You have to make your own decision to receive grace, which is just undeserved forgiveness. And you get that through faith. And that faith is simply saying, I believe Jesus died for me. That is the price. Like the wages of sin is death. I believe he died for me. And I'm choosing to follow him. 
I acknowledge my brokenness and believe that he died and rose again so that I could have life. I'm going to live for him. And in that moment, his spirit comes and lives inside of you. And it's like nothing we can explain, but you can look around and there's so many of us who have experienced it where it's like things are not the same. I've been changed. And so if that's you today, I want you in your own words, in your own heart, just to come before God and say something like, God, I need you. I ask you to forgive me for the ways I've messed up and done things my own way. I thank you that you love me so much that you, you paid a price for me to one day be with you in eternity, but you've also paid the price for me to have your spirit in me now. And so God, I ask for that. I ask for forgiveness. I ask for your spirit to fill me, to make me brand new and help me follow you from this day forward. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.